Are you seeing my screen now? I hope you're able to see my screen. Thank you. Uh, Sami, could you just confirm? Yes. Uh, okay, so friends, uh, we are doing family foundations. And as I was saying, uh, sorry, before the screen got jammed. We are doing family foundations and I'm going to share on on how the family began in Eden, where we have in Genesis 2.18, God forming man. And we see God created by his son. He created Adam and Eve. And God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Meet here, the word meet means suitable. In Eve, Adam had company like no other. Among the animals in Eden, there was none that he could have a relationship and company and fellowship like he had in Eve. So that is why Eve is an helpmeet for Adam and a woman is a helpmeet for the man even today. And so we realize that in Eden, even in Eden, Adam and Eve were warned that there was an enemy lurking around. And Ellen G. White writes this, that as soon as the Lord through Jesus created our world and placed Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden, Satan announced his purpose to conform to his own nature, the father and mother of all humanity. And so as our sister Alison presented yesterday, even as we go through courtship and marriage, we must recognize that there's a, an enemy that attacks the marriage set up the marriage institution right from the beginning he already set it that set it for attack that he wanted our first parents to conform to his nature and not the nature of god in which they were created and so i'll pick up a few things that i've found in a secular research that talks about the foundations how they're being shaken today and if you can see the graph that is on the screen, marriages per 1,000 people. This is worldwide. Uh, some countries are not, not represented, but just a few. This is a sampling of just a few countries. We have the United States, South Korea, Italy, UK, Australia, Argentina, Bolivia, etc. And as you can see, from 1920 to 2018, when those figures were available, we see that per 1,000 people, marriages, the number of marriages are going down. Marriages are going down over the years. Fewer and fewer people are getting married. It tells you that the institution of marriage is suffering attack. And if you look further, you will see that marriage is a big issue. This is just from the United States. The figure is often cited that about 50% of marriages end up being in divorce, they end up in divorce. But the marriage rate in the US is about 6.8% of the per 1,000 of the total population. 6.8, that means about seven people out of 1,000 people get married. But out of those people, 50% or half of them end up in divorce. So the US divorce rate, um, this is called the crude divorce rate uh, in statistics. Some people know what that means. But this is the number of people uh, getting married and divorced per 1,000 people. As of 2014, the Centers for Disease Control reports with 44 states and uh, Washington DC reporting that there are 3.2 or just about three per 1,000 people getting divorced. That's a really terrible statistic. Even then, we must recognize that even a single divorce is painful to God, even a single one. But yet we see the numbers are quite high, three per 1,000 population. Now, this is another worrying statistic, cohabitation. People living together, they're just married, but it's not official, they're just living together. This is 
of women between um, 15 to 49 years old who are married or living in a cohabiting union. And this is up to uh, 2020 projections. The figures were actually est uh, estimated until 2010, but it's projected for up to 2020. And we see again that it's kind of the same, uh, the same percentage about between uh, 60, between 55, up to about almost 80%. And here we see various continents represented here. We see that throughout the world, the trend is kind of going down, but kind of maintaining at around 68% uh, that about seven, seven, uh, seven, 70 percent of unions are in a uh, of cohabitation people just living loosely together and we see um, eastern africa slightly the figures are slightly going down but it's still worrying because that is about 60 percent of unions that people have just of people who look like they're married they're just living in a loose relationship and so this is one of the evidences of certain attacks on marriage that people are just living uh, together, maybe for pleasure, but not for a stable union that is recognized even by relatives and friends. And we also see single parent families, single parent families, either uh, from divorce or death, but mostly from divorce. We see that figures are increasing. We are seeing that in places like Colombia, that is the country with the highest number of, in this statistic, in this uh, research that was, that was carried by our world in data. This is, a, uh, the source is the UN population division in 2018. We see that as many as 13, almost 13% 13 of households are single parent, single parent families. And we see India, uh, United States, all those countries, uh, more and more families by 2015 were single parent families. This is not necessarily an indication of challenges in relationships, and some could be out of death, but it tells us that there's a, a big challenge because God did not intend that we have single parent families, but they are there. And now divorce again, this is just statistics from England and Wales. England and Wales, this is the most worrying statistic that I saw in the data. All the statistics from all the years, from 2016, from 1985 to 2016, all those places, marriages are increasingly ending in divorce. Uh, and the, the years are given in terms of uh, uh, how long the marriages lasted. And we see that um, all the years, all the years, divorce has been increasing. All the years, no, except for 1965 where it stabilized. But it still stabilized, meaning they were still happening. They didn't go down. All the years. Marriages are ending up, many, many marriages are ending up in divorce. Now, what are the reasons that people give for divorce? This was also studied. Um, and the first one that I saw was commitment. That, look at this, 75% of individuals said, individuals who were uh, asked these questions, that the problem why they're divorcing is because of commitment, lack of commitment. Commitment was the biggest problem. As almost 95% of couples that were divorcing, at least one of them said the problem was commitment. And then we see infidelity, conflict and arguing, marrying too young, people married when they were too young and now they realize the mistake, they divorce. Financial problems, substance abuse, domestic violence. These are some of the reasons that the world has started and seen as contributing to divorce. But friends, as children of God, we know that the greatest problem is not even these ones. These are mere symptoms. 
The problem is men's hearts, men's hearts, the sin problem that is uh, manifesting in these various ways. The sin problem is the main reason for divorce. And now this is uh, one of the statistics that is most worrying. We see, this is a map of the world and we see various continents where they are showing same-sex marriages. We are looking at evidences, current evidences of Satan's attack on the foundations, on the foundations of the family. And I say uh, confidently, friends, from Romans 1 and from Leviticus and other uh, passages in the Bible that same-sex marriages are not God's intention. And yet we see, just from 2019, look at that map. You see the dark places, the dark green places. Those are places where same-sex marriages are legal legal, recognized and sanctioned and allowed by government. And the places where it's light, light brown, those are places where it's not allowed. We can see, if you look at, if assuming that world populations, people are spread evenly, we'd almost say that half the people, half the world is legally recognizing same-sex marriages. Very worrying statistics. And so let's go back to the Bible. What does the Bible tell us about foundations and order in God's government? What did God intend to be the foundations of marriage? He says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 21 says, Therefore let no man glory in man, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death, or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. And so this alone tells us that Christ is under his Father, uh, and the, the, Paul tells us very clearly that we are Christ's, but Christ is also God's. And in that arrangement, in, in the family, we see that God is supreme, the source of all. We see that in Desire of Ages. But Christ is also God's, and Christ is the head of every man. And the head of the man, of the woman, is the man. And children come a little below that. And so that is the foundation or order of the family as God set it up. But you also see a little more in the heavenly hierarchy. The texts show the heavenly hierarchy, but that God is the head of Christ and then angels. If you look at Revelation 1 verse 1, you will see that it is the revelation of Christ as given to John, that Christ got that word from his father and is, is he signified it to the angels who brought it to Job. And so it tells us that Christ is indeed the head of every man. He sends angels to minister to man. This is also the, uh, the hierarchy that the centuri centurion recognized in Matthew chapter 8 when he speaks of Christ as the captain and he says that he knows that Christ is also under his father. And he knows that just like he sends soldiers to go, and they go. Christ also sends angels, and they go. Angels are swift and obedient to obey the father, to obey Christ, to obey their commander. And he sends them to minister to man. Paul tells us as much in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. And Christ's loving obedience, loving and willing obedience to his father is evidence not only of his divinity, but humility as well. This is symbolized on earth by children's obedience to parents in the fifth commandment as given to us in Exodus 20 verse 12. And because I know I'm speaking to some families and I'm speaking to people who belong to families, I'm speaking to parents, I'm speaking to young people. We have parents who are above us. Our obedience to parents shows we are also willing to obey our father 
and even parents, our obedience to God is an example to our children, which is symbolizing Christ's loving obedience to his father. May God bless us that we may see that truth even in our families. And Christ's obedience is given to us even in Psalm 46, I mean 40 verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin. Offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. This is Christ speaking. I delight to do your will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Christ is speaking here, but it's also us. Uh, David sees this in uh, Christ speaking, and that should also be our desire, that we delight to do God's will. Christ willingly obeyed his Father, and he says the law of God is written in the heart. May the law of God be written in our hearts as well. And Christ, in stooping to take upon himself humanity, revealed a character, the opposite of the character of Satan. I'm reading from the Desire of Ages, page 25, paragraph 1. But he stepped still lower in the path of humiliation. Being far in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is the obedience of Christ to his father as a son. He obeyed his father. And this shows us the, how deeply God loves us, that even his son, to save us, Christ humbled himself, even unto death, and not just any death, but death of the cross, very humiliating. Christ willingly and lovingly obeyed the Father and for our salvation. He humbled himself even unto death. He was obedient unto death, even accepted death of the cross. And so, Ellen G. White tells us in Child Guidance, page 83, paragraph 2, the youth and children who have praying parents have been greatly privileged. And uh, so, just as I, I, I break a bit, I remember our sister Alison read for us yesterday how young people, we ought to obey our parents in willing obedience because those of us who are privileged to have parents, we have great opportunity to learn what God wants us to learn. And so Ellen G. White writes the same thing in Child Guidance, one of the books, one of the books that our sister Alison recommended for young people to read as they prepare for marriage. And I begin the quote again. It says, the youth and children who have praying parents have been greatly privileged for such have an opportunity to know and love God. In respecting and rendering obedience to their parents, they may learn how to respect and obey their heavenly father. If they walk as the children of the light, they will be kind and courteous, loving and respectful to their parents, whom they have seen, and thus be better qualified to love God whom they have not seen. If they are faithful representatives of their parents, practicing the truth through the help given them of God, then by precept and example, they acknowledge the ownership of God and honor him by a well-ordered life and godly conversation. So um, I, I remember also from the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, there's a chapter on the marriage of Isaac where Ellen G. White talks about the role of parents in helping young people get into relationships that honor God. And so we see here that those of us who are parents, we are greatly privileged to have the opportunity to know and love God. Let me just take uh, a, little, a little water. And just going back to the foundations, because you're speaking about foundations, we see that certain attacks to institutions, the two institutions that we as the children of, of men got from Eden. The marriage relation was instituted before the fall. We see that in the verse we read in Genesis 2.18 and also verse 24. And using this as an illustration, God uses this as an illustration 
of his union with his church. This is Ephesians. We see that in Ephesians 5, 23, 25, 29 to 32. Christ through the word has taught precious lessons. It is a striking fact that the Sabbath and marriage, the two institutions which were established during man's innocency, are now the special objects of Satan's attack. Men are now declaring that both are a yoke of bondage, interfering with their liberty. True liberty is only found in being in harmony with God. That is in Psalms 119 verse 45, and is not an excuse for sin. True liberty is not an excuse for sin. First Peter 2 verse 16. And Satan attacks both the institution of marriage and the Sabbath. We're going to see a little more on this. The marriage and the Sabbath. I'm reading from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 63, uh, paragraph 2. Then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin, twin institutions for the glory of God in the benefit of humanity. Then, as the Creator joined the hands of the holy pair in wedlock, saying, A man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one. He enunciate, enunciated the law of marriage for all the children of Adam. Of Adam to the close of time. That which the eternal father himself had pronounced good was the law of the highest blessing and development for man, the marriage and the Sabbath. In Eden, twin institutions that for the glory of God are for the benefit of humanity. He pronounced them good and they remain good to the end of time, the Sabbath and marriage. And friends, we are going to see the link between the Sabbath and marriage, these two institutions that we got as humanity from Eden. Quoting again from Signs of the Times, February 28, 1884, Ellen G. White writes, there were two institutions founded in Eden that were not lost in the fall, the Sabbath and the marriage relation. These were carried by humanity beyond the gates of paradise. All who love and observe the Sabbath and maintain the purity of the marriage institution thereby prove themselves the friends of humanity and the friends of God. Friends, did you hear that? I'll repeat just that sentence. All who love and observe the Sabbath and maintain the purity of the marriage institution thereby prove themselves the friends of humanity and the friends of God. All who by precept or example, lessen the obligation of these sacred institutions are the enemies of both God and humanity and are using their influence and their God-given talents to bring in a state of confusion and moral corruption. I read this and just marvel because it tells us that not only is the marriage and the, is marriage and the Sabbath the two institutions of special object of Satan's attacks. But it also tells us there's something positive about this, that in observing, of observing the Sabbath and in maintaining the purity of the marriage, marriage institution, we hereby prove ourselves the friends of humanity and the friends of God. And so Seventh-day Adventists, we are highly privileged people that we can demonstrate our love for God and our love for humanity by keeping the Sabbath and by God's grace, honoring the, sub, the marriage institution. Because these two institutions were instituted in Eden and despite the fall of man into sin, God allowed them, God allowed humanity to carry these two institutions out of Eden. And we are told that by desecrating the Sabbath, by desecrating marriage, we show our enmity to God and we bring in a state of confusion and moral corruption. Friends, had you ever thought about how the Sabbath and marriage are linked in this manner? That by keeping the Sabbath by God's grace and we keep the Sabbath not for its own sake. We know the Sabbath was made for man, but we don't keep it for its own sake. 
we keep it to honor the creator to show that we know who created us and ellen g white writes elsewhere that if people honored the sabbath as they are meant to even the atheists would not have an excuse they would not have an excuse all would see that indeed we recognize he who created us and this is part of the three angels message part of the three angels message begins with honor god it begins the first angel honor god the creator but in honoring god we are also reminded that we must honor the marriage institution the sabbath and the marriage institution work together the desecration of one necessarily desecrates the other if you desecrate marriage you are also desecrating the sabbath if you desecrate the sabbath you are also violating the marriage institution and observing both maintaining the purity of both honors god and shows we are friends of both god and humanity and through both god seeks to save us do you know that god seeks to save us through these two institutions he seeks to save humanity having fallen in eden fallen into sin god seeks to save humanity through the sabbath and through the marriage institution what is our the counsel to families god gave only one cause why a wife should leave her husband and i'm quoting from tsb tsb 159 paragraph 2 god gave only one cause why a wife should leave her husband or the husband leave his wife which was adultery i remember reading i think in malachi that god calls us god calls men to to stay and keep the wife of your youth the wife of your youth even women we are also called to keep the husband of your youth but mostly this is addressing men to keep the husband of your youth reading again tsb 159 paragraph 2 god gave only one cause why a wife should leave a husband or the husband leave his wife which was adultery let this ground be prayerfully considered marriage was from the creation constituted by god a divine ordinance the marriage institution was made in eden the sabbath of the fourth commandment was instituted in eden when the foundations of the world were laid when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of god shouted for joy then let this god's institution of marriage stand before you as firm as the sabbath of the fourth commandment friends if you needed evidence of that links marriage and the sabbath this is it inspiration tells us that both were instituted in eden and quoting job the morning stars sang together and all the sons of god shouted for joy when they saw marriage and the sabbath god's institution right from creation so let both stand before us firmly firmly as a commandment both marriage and the sabbath they should stand firm in our lives and the only reason that a man should leave his his wife is adultery and the only reason why a wife should leave her husband is adultery and let we are told let this ground be prayerfully considered because marriage is a divine ordinance instituted by god himself i read something um a letter that ellen g white wrote to a dr q dr q addressed as dr q um one of the books that sister alison recommended to us is the book adventist home adventist home is not only full of counsel to individuals seeking marriage but you also see in that book several letters written to real people of things that god revealed to his servant for our sake and they are recorded that we might see real lives of real people and this is an example a letter to dr q this is also from tsb page 160 paragraph 9 and she says i was in the night season in my dreams brought in connection with the health retreat this is one of the institutions where the adventist church was working among the pioneers i felt grieved to see you dr q unhappy and much discouraged 
But while I was distressed over this revelation to me, there was one speaking with you, Dr. Q. His words reproved you, but were mingled with tender compassion. When God reproves us, he speaks with tender compassion. I cannot write the exact words, quoting. I cannot write the exact words as he spoke them. I will try my best to give you the import of them, he said. This is a person who Ellen G. White was shown speaking to Dr. Q. You are nourishing despondency, but in this, you are not wise. You will become weak and inefficient. This will give the enemy advantage over you. God would have you grow nearer and closer to himself to resemble the image and character of Christ. Your heart is the seat of many tumultuous feelings which you do not strive vigorously to overcome. You do not put your full heart and will into the work of cleansing the soul temple. Your mind is unwisely exercised on the subject of divorce from your wife. God is not leading you in this. We see that, and this is the angel speaking to Dr. Q, and Ellen G. White is seeing it and recording it. And the angel is telling Dr. Q that he's hell-bent, if you allow me to use that word. He's hell-bent. He's exercising his mind. He's, he's keen, pushing that he must divorce his, his wife. And the angel is telling him, God is not leading you in this. The reason why this letter is brought up, just like the letters and the correspondences in Adventist home, is to show us that not only was God giving counsel, and some of the counsels were given before the things happened. And those who obeyed the counsels retreated from evil intentions or sinful intentions were saved. Even the, their marriages were saved. And this letter to Dr. Q tells us that he was keen to divorce his wife. And the angel is telling him, in his mind, he's shown clearly that this subject on which he is exercising his mind is not godly. God is not leading him. And Ellen G. White records it for us. Uh, we see that if we obey God, we will understand that we are yoked together with Christ. We are not to separate. We are to exercise unity in marriage in order to demonstrate our unity with the family above. And even from the beginning, Adam and Eve were yoked together with Christ. I know that in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, we are told to take the, the, the yoke of Christ. And we see in marriage, we are yoked together. Husband and wife are yoked together. But the greater demonstration is our yoke with Christ, with Christ, to learn to walk with Christ, to learn from him. That's actually the message in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Take my yoke upon you. To be yoked is not so much to be burdened. In fact, Christ says his burden is light. His burden is light. He takes our heavy burden and he gives us his burden, which is light. And beyond that, he even gives us the grace and power to walk with him in the light of God, in the light of his Father. And quoting from Adventist Home, page 102, paragraph 1, Ellen G. White writes, the blessing of God in the home where this union shall exist is as the sunshine of heaven because it is the Lord's ordained will that man and wife should be linked together in holy bonds of union under Jesus Christ with him to control and his spirit to guide. Is it possible that where divorce happens, like in the case of Dr. Q was planning to uh, and really, really pushing to divorce his wife. Is it possible that divorce is happening, not even so much that people have problems between themselves, but because people have a poor relationship with Christ. Indeed, many times the marriage institution is illustrated as a triangle with Christ at the apex, God at the apex, and the closer we draw to Christ, the closer we also draw to one another. And so where you see 
divorce and problems in marriages happening, it is because people are not growing closer to Christ. The closer we draw to Christ, the closer we find each other, the closer we also draw to one another. And so where there are problems in marriage, let us draw closer to Christ in the holy bonds of union and under Jesus Christ with him to control, his spirit to guide, we will find the sunshine of heaven. Ellen D. White calls it a little heaven down here in Adventist home. Even in, in the marriage, Adam and Eve, like all humanity, and I'm quoting from Signs of the Times, Signs of the Times, May 9th, 89, 1892, paragraph 9. Adam and Eve, like all humanity, were to grow in uh, knowledge of God's love in an eternal fellowship. This is what she writes in Science of the Times, May 9th, 1892. Through all eternity, we are to grow in knowledge of him who is the head of all things in the church. If we would draw upon his grace, we must feel our poverty. Our souls must be filled with an intense longing after God until we realize that we shall perish unless Christ shall put upon us his spirit and grace and do the work for us. We will keep growing even in eternity in knowledge of him who is the head of all things. He who loved us so much, he gave his life for us. He who loved us so much, he gave his son for us. In John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all who believe in him shall have eternal life. And indeed, we have eternal life when we believe in Christ. And we must grow in knowledge like uh, Adam and Eve were to grow in an eternal fellowship with God. And so as we see, family beginning in Genesis 2.18, God saying, uh, man should not live alone should not, he makes a help meet for him. And we see uh, that God brought Eve from the rib of Adam. Verse 21 of Genesis 2 says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which, verse 22, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Shows the great, great union that exists between a husband and a wife. And we are told in Adventist home, page 25, paragraph 3, Adventist home, page 25, paragraph 3, God gave himself, sorry, God himself gave Adam a companion. He provided and helped meet for him a helper corresponding to him, one who was fitted to be his companion and who could be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam Signify, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. Today, knowing that Satan attacks the institution of marriage and Sabbath, there are movements today to make women, uh, there is a feminist movement that even there's what is called radical feminism that even tends to make women above men. I know there are many faults that men have, but the solution is not to make women the head of men or even to make women an independent force to themselves. The only way that we can restore the dignity of humanity is for the woman to stand equal with man, recognizing that the man is the head of the family and even the man is under Christ and Christ is God's. That in this loving relationship, the marriage institution and the Sabbath might be restored. But even the man, the caution to us, godly caution is that the woman 
is not to control the man and also not to be trampled as an inferior, but to stand side by side as an equal in this relationship, to be loved and protected by the man. This is the relationship that is foundational to marriage. In this relationship, man is ahead of the house and Christ is ahead of the man. And the woman respects the man as an equal in the family of, of God to be brought into a relationship with God. And the man is to be recognized to be the head of the house, the priest of the house, to love his wife and to protect his wife. And in the marriage relationship, should they be blessed with children, that in this recognition of God as the source of all, we live in such a way that restores both marriage and the Sabbath and our relationship with God. Um, man and woman are to have affection, affectionate attachment. This is very foundational. Again, quoting from Adventist Home, page 25, we see that she says, a part of man, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. She was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that should exist in the marriage relationship. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes, nourisheth it, nourisheth and cherisheth it. Therefore, uh, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall, shall be one. Uh, here Ellen G. White quotes from Ephesians chapter 5 and she also quotes from Genesis chapter 2. This is recorded for us, recorded for us in Adventist home, page 25, paragraph 3. Man and woman are to have affectionate attachment. Affectionate attachment. In Genesis 2.25, we see something noble and beautiful. In Genesis 2, verse 25, it is recorded for us that and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. Adam's height was much greater. I'm quoting from Patrick and Prophets, page 45, paragraph 3. Adam's height was much greater than that of men who now inhabit the earth. Eve was somewhat less in stature, yet her form was noble and full of beauty. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory, such as the angels wear. So long as they lived in obedience to God, this robe of light continued to enshroud them. The robe of light, the righteousness of Christ, which holy angels have, surrounded the holy pair, and in restoration, God will give this back to man. In the character that our sister spoke about yesterday, we saw, she also quoted this paragraph yesterday, that the affectionate relationship that, affect, that uh, is, is between man and woman is a recognition of the relationship that should be between us and Christ that shows how his righteousness covers us. In the same manner, that holy angels are clothed with the light and glory, the righteousness of Christ, we too are to be covered by the righteousness of Christ. We attain this in character formation. I remember our sister really stressed character formation. Is character formation, do we recognize that character formation is the main objective of the Sabbath and the marriage institution that God seeks to restore our character in him through these two institutions? that through them, God may clothe us again with the righteousness of Christ. The same righteousness that angels have. Angels don't have their own light. Holy angels don't have their own light. They have the light and glory of Christ. He who created them has given them light and glory. And in the ministration of angels to man, they minister the presence, the glory, the majesty of God unto us, that by character formation we may reflect again the character of God to the world. Is this our desire to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ? Again, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve in Eden in Genesis 2.25, we see they were both naked and they were not ashamed. They were clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Our eternal fellowship with God is also given to us by Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then 
face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. In uh, James White writes for us in uh, ARSH, ARSH, February 28, 1856, page 170, paragraph 16. James White writes, writes to us something that is for our reflection. From these reflections, the reasonable conclusion is that the design of God was that man should be an intimate associate of his creator. This conclusion is confirmed by the record of the mutual intimacy before man's sin and expulsion from the garden and the presence of God. Man was designed to have an intimate association with his creator. And we thank God that these things are written for our admonition and for our encouragement. So because you're talking about courtship, young people who are listening, Christian courtship is lacking in many of our relationships today. There are many courtship practices all around us today. I remember our sister was asking, I think that was a question to her. Is it all right to date or to have courtship on social media? I remember that question. And I, I know that's a practice today. There are many courtship practices all around us today, especially among the youth. Indeed, some, and our sister, I remember saying, uh, some actually work, but it's not the best. Some of these relationships, even on social media, may lead to marriage, but many also fail desperately, even among believers. So what makes a difference? Have you asked yourself what makes a difference? It is only in the context of God's love for man, the love of the father and the son, that Christian courtship be found. Only in that context could Christian courtship be found. Outside of that, we may have marriages that seem to work, but really, in reality, they don't reflect the glory of God. The only way we are to reflect the glory of God is to have a courtship that recognizes God as the foundation and pillar of human relationships. And outside of that, marriages will not work. Uh, the Ministry of Healing, one of the books that is recommended for us that we should read in preparation for marriage. This quote is also in Adventist Home, page 68, paragraph 2. It is only in Christ that a marriage alliance can be safely formed. Human love should draw its closest bonds from divine love. Only where Christ reigns can there be deep, true, and selfish affection. Young people, why are we courting? We court for marriage, that we may see how to reflect God's relationship with us in marriage. If we are courting for any other reason, if we are dating for any other reason, we should know that that is not a safe union. Only, the only safety can be found in Christ. It is only in Christ that a marriage alliance can be safely found. If we have a relationship cohabiting, uh, just having relationships for the pleasure of satisfying human passions, we know that that is not a safe union. That is not a safe alliance. The only safe alliance is that which is found in Christ. And we are, we are admonished that courtship should only be where the two, the young man and the young woman, seek the company of angels, that whatever we think, whatever we say and do, the angels, the holy angels, should love to be present there. If the angels draw away, we should know. If anything that we are doing or saying or practicing in, a, in, a, in courtship, if whatever we do does not give glory to God, then we know that relationship should be broken. It should be broken. Ellen G. White writes again in Science of the Times, June 11th, 1920, the sweetest type of heaven is a home where the spirit of the Lord presides. If the will of God is fulfilled, the husband and wife will respect each other and cultivate love and confidence. Many people are looking for joy. People are depressed. People are suffering in many ways in this world. 
we are told our source of joy is a home where the spirit of the Lord presides. If our relationships do not honor God, eventually, if they're not already in distress, we know there'll, there'll be desperation, there will be lack of joy, there will be anger and the manifestations. Those things that we saw at the beginning, the reasons for divorce, the things that are causing violence in the home, those things, if God is not honored in marriage, very soon, if not already, there is the spirit of the devil itself in that relationship. And if the will of God is to be fulfilled, the husband and wife will respect each other and cultivate love and confidence in all things. We praise God. So in making the choice, in making the choice, young people are trying to make the choice. Who should I marry? Who should I marry? The choice of a life companion, Adventist Home, page 45, paragraph 4. The choice of a life companion should be such as best to secure physical, mental, and spiritual well-being for parents and for their children, such as will enable both parents and children to bless their fellow man and to honor their creator. If you have a relationship which only secures the physical, really, that is not a relationship that honors God. A relationship that is wholesome, wholesome, should secure, best secure, physical, mental, and spiritual well-being, not only for parents, but also for children. Where a relationship honors God in the physical, mental, and spiritual, then indeed, that is a home that honors God. In making the choice, ask yourself, will this relationship secure physical, mental, and spiritual well-being? Not just for myself, the young man. I shouldn't just seek one that secures my physical well-being, mental well-being, spiritual well-being. It should be both, it should be both. Do I get into this, as I get into this relationship, as I make the choice, am I also helping her to secure physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. You, you a young woman, as you make the choice, are you making the choice that will secure physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of this young man? That both of you, if you should be blessed with children, that all of you will be blessed of God to walk the path of righteousness and to cross from death to life to walk into God's heavenly kingdom together. Let a young man seek one to stand by his side who is fitted to, to bear her share of life's burdens, one whose influence will enable and refine him and who will make him happy in her love. This is to men, young men. Seek one who will stand by your side, fitted to share her share of life's burdens, one whose influence will ennoble and refine him and refine you and will make you happy in her love. As you seek to make her happy, let her also make you happy that she will take her share of life's burdens and you will also take your share of life's burdens and together you will be refined and ennobled, ennobled and even enabled by the Spirit of God to walk in the path of righteousness. Adventist Home, page 40, 45, paragraph 5. Look at this. I marveled when I first learned about this. I didn't know this until not so long ago, maybe about five years ago. I learned that uh, God sought in his own will to create man in such a way that with character formation, and I remember Sister Allison stressing this yesterday, that God when he has restored man in his character and in the similitude of his son, then man will replace angels. Did you know that? If we recognize this, then that will be foundational in our relationship. Let us see what the SDA Bible commentary writes, for, uh, inspiration writes for us. SDA Bible commentary, uh, volume one, page 1082. Page 1082, volume one of SDA Bible commentary. 
God created man for his own glory that after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family. This is a real marvel. I remember our sister Alison stressing this, that we are under the investigative judgment that began in 1844. We are under probation that God might test us to see whether we are suited for the company of holy beings in heaven. And after test and trial, after God gives us victory in his son, we might become one with the heavenly family. It is God's purpose still to repopulate heaven with a human family. That which was lost, a third of the angels, God seeks to replace that with humanity. If we see that, we will recognize the love of God for man. And we will, if we walk in the light of God, knowing that we are being shaped, being shaped to join the family of God in heaven, then we will walk circumspectly, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. We will walk circumspectly, knowing that we are being shaped to be in the company of holy angels for eternity. The Review and Herald, May 29, 1900, she writes the same, the same thought. The vacancies made in heaven by the fall of Satan and his angels will be filled by the redeemed of the Lord. And parents, it's our privilege that when we get children, these children shall also be candidates to replace the angels that fell from heaven, that God seeks to repopulate heaven with humanity. What a privilege, what a privilege. Child of God, listening today, do we realize our such, it's such a great privilege that we are to replace the angels that were uh, lost from heaven. And as I, as I, I reach towards the end, I'm wondering why, um, whether we have thought about this, that we have reached a time to reform. This is a time to reform. Knowing the link between the Sabbath and marriage, the marriage institution, we see that it is a time to reform. And we have a biblical foundational example. This is not the first time. Our time has reached when the Sabbath has been desecrated, trampled to the ground. Even you, you perhaps in your mind, you're thinking, it could never get worse, could never get worse. The violation of marriage has reached a level where even same-sex marriages are sanctioned by government itself. They are saying it is okay. We support it, we encourage it. I'm telling you, you think, you may be thinking it couldn't get worse. But Nehemiah, Nehemiah saw a time when people need to reform. We need Sabbath reform, we need marriage reform. Nehemiah saw it. Let's turn to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. And we see the context of this is that those who, are, who returned to Jerusalem sought to seal themselves to God, or rather to be sealed by God in the actions of men. They sealed themselves to God by a covenant. They swore to God to seek a restoration, a reform. And Nehemiah saw, again, you see a link between the Sabbath and marriage. Where the Sabbath is desecrated, even marriage is desecrated. And these who sought to uh, seal themselves to God by a covenant, their names are listed. That itself is quite something. The people are listed by name. Do you know, just like in Revelation 14, God sealing the 144,000, he calls them by name. God calls you by name. He tells us he has called us by name. And he knows the number of the hairs on our very heads. And not one falls to the ground without him allowing it. So God seals us by name. Even in Nehemiah's time, those names of those who sought to walk with God are recorded by name. May our names be recorded in God's book of life. When we believe in him, he records our names. 
he puts our names in his book of life. May we seek to reform the Sabbath and marriage. Nehemiah 10, verses 29 to 31. Be before verse 29, we see the names listed, those who seal themselves to God. Swore by a covenant that by God's grace they would keep the covenant to walk in God's law. Verse 30 of Nehemiah 10 says, and that we would not, one of the things is well, and that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. Verse 31. And if the people of the, of the land bring where or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Do you see the things that these who sought to rebuild Jerusalem covenanted with God? They covenanted that they would not give their daughters unto the people of the land. Do you remember in Genesis, Abraham saying that Isaac would not be married to the daughters of Canaan? Do you see the same thought here? The same principle? The same, the, the same principle is recorded in the people by the people who returned to Jerusalem to rebuild Jerusalem. Is it a time to rebuild Jerusalem? Yes, it is a time to rebuild Jerusalem. We should covenant not to give our daughters unto the people of the land and also not to take their daughters for our sons. And again, see this link. And if the people of the land bring where or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy it from them. We will not buy it from them. Nehemiah is showing us again the link between the Sabbath and marriage. Where the Sabbath is violated, marriage is also violated. Where the marriage, where marriage is violated, the Sabbath is also desecrated. Nehemiah 13, verses 15 to 20. By the way, let us read Nehemiah 10, all of it. Let us also read Nehemiah 13. We don't have the time for it here, but you will see Nehemiah's testimony. Nehemiah's testimony. Hear what he says in Nehemiah 13, verses 15 to 28. I may not read all of it, but let me read some of it that we may see the testimony that the prophet of God saw, and which he records for our admonition today. Verse 15. In those days, I saw in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and leading asses, all, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. Victuals means food. Verse 16. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish, and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. They sold things. They sold things on the Sabbath. They brought things. They were trading wine presses, doing ordinary things, doing their own works on the Sabbath. Nehemiah's testimony. Verse, chapter 13, verse 17. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that you do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city, yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Nehemiah is contending with the nobles, the priests, the rulers of Judah, asking them, what is this that you do? You are profaning the Sabbath day. Didn't your fathers do the same thing? And isn't this the reason why God brought evil upon us, the captivity of Israel? Upon the city, Israel was sent into captivity for breaking the Sabbath, for profaning the Sabbath. But yet there's more. Chapter 13, verse 22. Let's jump to verse 22. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O God, concerning this also and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. Nehemiah did a good thing to ask the Levites to cleanse themselves. But he's not attributing this, this to himself. He's saying 
this is the greatness of thy mercy by thy mercy he he remembers it is by the mercy of god that he commanded the levites to cleanse themselves and should come to keep the gates to sanctify the sabbath day verse 23 in those days also so i jews that had married wives of ashdod of ammon and of moab and their children speak in half the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews language, language, but according to the language of each people. Do you see Nehemiah linking marriage and the Sabbath here? He's saying that the Jews who had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon and of Moab spoke in half the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language. By the way, uh, languages are disappearing. I'm not saying that languages stand for themselves. Our languages are disappearing. And those of us who have the pri privilege of teaching our language to our children, may God help us. It is good to teach our indigenous languages to our children. And I, re I remember uh, there's a council in Ministry of Healing that Ellen G. White talks about marriages not to be mixed. But yet there's a context, there's a context. The context is this, the Jews were to maintain their purity, their purity, not for its own sake. The Jewish language, the Hebrew language was not for its own sake. And even that is a context in which Ellen G. White writes in a Ministry of Healing that mixed marriages uh, have challenges, they have challenges. But the greater thought, the greater principle in that in that thought is this, that we must maintain purity. I'm not saying, I know many of us are in mixed marriages, uh, husband and wife, not from the same tribe or from the same race, not a big deal. The issue is this, just like we saw in Genesis uh, uh, chapter five, chapter six, the children of my man marrying the children, the children of God, mixing themselves with the children of God. The purity is the issue here. It is not so much about language. But Nehemiah records this for our sake, that he saw the Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and of Ammon and of Moab, those nations that they were forbidden to marry from, not because those nations were anything bad in, 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 in such a manner of the children of men as we see today. Yes, indeed, they were evil. But mixed marriages uh, were condemned by God because they were, they were mixing pure blood with impure blood. What is pure blood today? Pure blood are pure because God has sanctified them. All who have been called to walk with God are sanctified by God. And mixed marriages, people marrying from one community to another is not a big issue unless one is marrying unequally yoked with unbelievers. Unbelievers, unbelievers marrying mix purity and impurity. And we see that the evidence of this in Nehemiah's time was that the children born out of these marriages spoke in the half in the speech of Ashdod and they were struggling and mumbling. They couldn't speak the Jews language. What is the language, language we are meant to speak today? It is the language of purity, purity, character formation. Character formation is our great objective in this time. We should speak a pure language, a language that speaks the three angels message, not half and a half job. You are half in the world, you are half serving God and giving an uncertain, uh, the watchman is giving an uncertain sound. The people don't know whether to run to the hills People don't know whether to continue marrying and giving in marriage. People in the world thinking all is just normal. They are speaking today of a new normal. We must speak a clear language, a language that is pure, that tells people, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. The first angel's message. The children of Israel were called to restore and build Jerusalem. And yet those who were to speak, they were coming with children. They had themselves married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, of Moab, the children of God today. Are we married 
to the wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab, that our children, our children out of these marriages cannot speak the language of God. They are speaking half the speech, half the speech of Ashdod. We even remember the gods of Ashdod. They're speaking half the language of Ashdod. We must remember that Nehemiah's message is a call to purity, a call to reform, that we must have a pure language. Our language is a language of warning to the world. Things are not normal, my friends. Things are not normal. We are to call the world to the third angel's message. Our Babylon is fallen. We must not receive the mark of the beast. We must speak. The watchman must give a certain sound, not half, half and a half job, speaking the language of the world, speaking the language of Ashdod, engaging in the pleasures of this world, and yet also claiming we are Levites. We are, we are the children of the, of the priesthood of Christ. No, we must speak a pure language, a pure language, not a half and a half job. Nehemiah tells us in chapter 13, verse 25, and I, I, and I contended with them and cast them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, ye shall not give your daughters unto the, their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Women caused Solomon, that great king of Israel, who God said be, there shall be no king like him. He was beloved, yet... Solomon sinned by marrying outlandish women who caused him to sin. Verse 27. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? Strange wives. Strange wives that bring the gods of Ammon, the gods of Moab, into Jerusalem. We are to build Jerusalem. How shall we build Jerusalem if we are married to the, the daughters of Moab, we are giving our daughters to their sons. We are also taking their daughters unto ourselves and unto our sons. How shall we speak a clear language? I tell you, the evidence is in the Bible. When we get married, even spiritually, there's a spiritual lesson here for us. When we spiritually get linked to the daughters of Moab and of Ashdod, our children, we ourselves will speak half the language of those people half the language of those gods. We see strange gods brought into the church of God today. It is because people are married. People are married to the children, the daughters of Moab. And we are giving our daughters to them. And we are taking their daughters to marry our sons. We end up speaking half and a half. Their language, the language of God and the people of the world to whom we should share the light, Matthew 5, 16. The light that we have should not be hid in a, under a bushel or under the bed. It should be clear. It should not be such that people are hearing half this, half that. It should be clear language. Nehemiah's testimony is recorded for us. <clears throat> ne uh, excuse me. <clears throat> Nehemiah 13, verse 28. And one of the sons of Joyada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. Do we remember Sanballat as recorded in Nehemiah? One of the kings who troubled Nehemiah. And you remember Nehemiah and those who are rebuilding the walls. Half of the time they were carrying weapons. Half of the time they were building. Because they, they were faced with challenges. Sanballat and the other kings of that, of that land, Tobia and the others, even laughing at Israel and saying, even a fox climbs on these walls that you're rebuilding, the walls will come down. And they sought to even bring more to discourage the priests. One of the sons of Joyada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, who was son-in-law to Sanbalat. Sanbalat. Children of God, are some of the problems that we are facing in marriage because 
we are married to the heathen, the heathen who we know are heathen indeed, and yet we are married to them, and we see the son-in-law to the son of a high priest is also a son-in-law to Sanballat, a half and a half job. Here you are, you are the son of the high priest. Who is our high priest today? Christ is our high priest. Can we afford to be sons-in-law to the, the kings and queens of this world who are working for the downfall, who are discouraging the people of God from rebuilding Jerusalem? We cannot afford it. We cannot afford to be half the sons of God and sons-in-law to the children of, of the world. Never. It cannot work. The world will not get a clear message. In these verses, Nehemiah calls for Sabbath and marriage reform, a call to return to the purity and sanctity of the two institutions, the two institutions, for they are intrinsically linked. They're intrinsically linked by the word of God. Today, this is our call as well. As I finish, we see that these from patriarchs, uh, from prophets and kings, from, from prophets and kings, page 673, paragraph two, PK 673, paragraph two. These unlawful alliances were causing great confusion in Israel. For some who entered into them were men of in high position, rulers to whom the people had the right to look for counsel and a safe example. For seeing the ruin before the nation, if this evil were allowed to continue, Nehemiah reasoned honestly with the wrong, wrongdoers. Pointing to the case of Solomon, he reminded them that among all the nations, there had risen no king like this man to whom God had given great wisdom. Yet idolatrous women had turned his heart from God and his example had corrupted Israel. Do you see what Nehemiah did? He chased the son-in-law of Sanballat from him. Is it time to chase some people away from ourselves? Maybe it is time to chase some people away from ourselves. I'm not saying, I'm not calling for violence, but see how Nehemiah in his zeal for God, he chased the son of Joyada, the son of, the, of Eliashib, the high priest. He chased him away from himself because he was causing confusion in Israel. Causing confusion in Israel. And Solomon, Solomon, none of us has ever reached the wisdom of Solomon. Even the queen of Sheba came from Ethiopia to see him because his fame had spread through the world. Solomon, such a wise king, given wisdom by God, corrupted himself with idolatrous women. And his children, his family was destroyed. His concubines, they turned his heart from God. And by his example, he corrupted Israel. Rulers, priests in Israel today, that people have a right to look and to ask for counsel and a safe example. We have the duty and responsibility to restore. We have a duty to give example in our marriages, in the way we honor the Sabbath. People have a right, those around us, our neighbors, our friends, people in the church have a right, ministers of God, they have a right to look and to ask for example and for counsel, just like the nations had a right to look to Israel. These priests who are serving the living God, they say they're serving the living God. How do they keep the Sabbath? How do they, do they honor their marriages? Do they honor these marriages by doing half and a half job? A half and a half job. God says in Isaiah, I think Isaiah chapter five, is it Isaiah chapter five, where it talks, is there anything more I could have done for this vineyard? There is nothing that God has spared. He gave heaven's best gift for us. Shall we misuse the gift of Christ in us? The gift of Christ's sacrifice to man by doing a half and a half job such that the world cannot even see. They can't hear a clear message. Prophets and kings Page 674, paragraph 3. Many who had mar married idolaters chose to go with them into exile. And these 
with those who had been expelled from the congregation joined the Samaritans. Hither, some who had occupied high positions in the work of God found their way and after a time cast in their lot, cast in their lot fully with them. Desiring to strengthen this alliance, the Samaritans promised to adopt more fully the Jewish faith and customs. And the apostates, determined to outdo their former brethren, erected a temple on Mount Gerizim in opposition to the house of God at Jerusalem. Their religion continued to be a mixture of Judaism and heathenism, and their claim to their claim to be the people of God was a source of schism, emulation, and enmity between the two nations from generation to generation. Friends, do we see what is happening here? That the Jews who had married, married these idols, idolaters and gone with them into exile now come and then they join the Samaritans. We see insight into the enmity between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans claiming to be the people of God, desire, and they say, we will, do our, we will outdo our brethren in Jerusalem. They have the temple of God there. We are also setting up a temple to our gods here, and we are going to outdo them. They sought to outdo their former brethren. Those they, were, they ought to have walked with had they not married this idolater. So they erect a temple in Mount Gerizim in opposition to the house of God at Jerusalem. Children of God, have houses, have temples been erected in Mount Gerizim today? Those have been erected, I tell you from the word of God, it is not my own words, they are erected in opposition to the house of God at Jerusalem. We know our Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the truth of God. But those who are claiming, these false brethren, they are claiming also to be worshiping God. And so they bring a mixture of truth and error. Truth and error. How did the Trinity gods come into Jerusalem? It is because people sought the mixed truth and error. Married to the wives, of, uh, wives and daughters of Ashdod and Ammon and all those. They bring error and mix it with truth. And today, they even defend it with verses. Defended with verses. Even Sunday worship, defended with verses like Colossians 2.16. People claiming that you should not judge them. Yet we see from the word of God, it is a mixture of Judaism and heathenism. It is Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim. And because of this, there's confusion, there's schism, separation, emulation, enmity between the nation of God and the nation of Samaria. To date, from generation to generation, this is a problem. A special object. It is because he knows through them, he will mix truth and error. He will mix truth and error, such that even the priests who are serving God, the priesthood, the priesthood, God who has called us from darkness into his marvelous light, this this priesthood, we are not praising God anymore. This priesthood is mixed. When it is mixed with truth and error, we cannot give a certain sound. It becomes a source of schism, emulation, and enmity between the nation of God and the, nation, the nations of the world. We must seek to restore the truth. What is our call today? Prophets and kings. Page 675, paragraph 1. In the work of reform to be carried forward today, there is need of men who, like Ezra and Nehemiah, will not palliate or excuse sin, nor shrink from vindicating the honor of God. Those upon whom rests the burden of this work will not hold their peace when wrong is done. Neither will they cover evil with a cloak of false charity, they will remember that God is no respecter of persons and that severity to a few may prove mercy to many. They will remember also that in the one who rebukes evil, the spirit of Christ should ever be revealed. Do you remember Nehemiah saying, I chased 
the, the son-in-law of Sanballat from me, we are reminded that in the work of reform, this rebuke to a few may prove mercy to many. It may prove mercy to many. If it calls for chasing some away from us, some of us have been chased from our churches because we spoke the truth. We saw the truth and we believed in the truth of the father and the son. It is a time for restoration. Nehemiah chased away those who were causing confusion. He, ch he said he chased away this son of Sanballat, who was also the son of a high priest. He chased him away from himself. And the word of God inspiration records to us that the severity to a few may prove mercy to many. Yet in all this, in all this, let us remember also that the one who rebukes evil should do it in the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ should be revealed when we rebu rebuke evil. There's a place where it is written in his inspiration, I think referring to chapters like Matthew chapter 23, when Christ rebukes the Pharisees, he spoke with tears in his voice, tears in his voice. These who are supposed to exemplify the love of God, but are engaging in confusion, bringing heathenism and paganism, pagan gods into the house of God, as Christ condemned their actions, he condemned sin. He spoke with tears in his voice, tears in his voice. Even us, as we chase away the son-in-law of Sanballat, we must chase him away. For us to be true to God, we must chase him away. If for any reason we cannot chase him away, let us leave. Let us leave where the son of Sanballat is reigning, calling himself the son of a high priest. By law, he is also meant to be a high priest. When his father leaves the seat, he takes the seat and becomes high priest. Calling us to follow him, in his apostasy. If that is where we are, we must leave. Ellen D. White writes to us that there shall be a coming out until the close of time. If evil is reigning in a place and we cannot chase them away, let us leave. Let us seek to restore the truth of God in Jerusalem, not in Mount Gerizim. But as we do it, as we rebuke evil, the spirit of Christ should ever be revealed should ever be revealed, the character of Christ, the cloak, sorry, the righteousness of, rice, of Christ that covers the angels, the righteousness of Christ that covered Adam and Eve when he created them and put them in the garden of Eden, even that spirit of Christ, the character of Christ should be revealed in us even as we rebuke sin. The sons of the son-in-law of Sanballat cannot dwell in Jerusalem and use Jerusalem the name of God as a cloak to foster apostasy. It brings confusion. The world is in confusion. Do we see that marriage and the Sabbath, where the devil has shaken the foundations, the word of God cannot be spoken to anymore because there's confusion. People are speaking half and half the truth, half apostasy, half paganism, and the world cannot hear the certain sound that tells them we must run to the hills. We must run to the hills. We are called to repair the breach. Prophets and Kings 678, paragraph two. In the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. The breach made in the law at the time the Sabbath was changed by man is to be repaired. God's remnant people standing before the world as reformers are to show that the law of God is the foundation of all enduring reform and that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is to stand as a memorial of creation, a constant reminder of the power of God. In clear, distinct lines, they are to present the necessity of obedience to all the precepts of the Decalogue. Constrained by the love of Christ, they are to cooperate with him in building up the waste places. They are to be repairers of the breach, restorers of paths to dwell in. Uh, quoting, I think, Isaiah 61, we must repair the breach. Just like Nehemiah and Ezra sought to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem by, our, by the grace of God, by our 
honoring marriage by our keeping the Sabbath to honor God, we are, to, we are to restore the bridge. We are to repair the bridge, not to restore the bridge, sorry, but to, to rebuild that which was destroyed, to restore the path to dwell in, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, that the world may hear the word, the call of God in clear, distinct lines to present the necessity of obedience to all the precepts of the Decalogue. We see here that when the Sabbath of, of God was changed, changed by man, even marriage was affected. Nehemiah shows us that. We are to restore, the, we are to restore that which was lost. We are to repair the bridge. We are to repair the bridge and re remind the people of the world, we have to remind God's people that the fourth commandment stands as a memorial of creation, that which reminds us of who created us and him to whom we belong. So as we end, let's ask ourselves these questions. How does divorce or the desecration of marriage relate to spirituality or lack thereof among Christians today? We saw that the call of Nehemiah is to reform us. Are you a reformer today? Ask yourself this question. How does my marriage relationship relate to spirituality? How does it give evidence of spirituality among Christians today? How does Sabbath reform and marriage reform affect my spirituality? And this is <clears throat> the question to many of us here who have believed the truth about God the Father and His Son. How does the truth about God the Father and His Son make a difference in my marriage and in my courtship? Many of us have believed the truth about God and His Son. Many of us in the Father-Son message are called reformers. We are called to be reformers. And so, we are to reflect. We are to reflect the glory of God as we end, as we end. Let us seek the call to reform. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us to reform our marriages, to reform the Sabbath, that we may show glory unto you who is the source of all things. We know marriage is in trouble. We know courtships in trouble, but yet you have given us your word. Bless us, O oh Lord, that you may restore all things. Through these two institutions, we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.